Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another webinar by Medmark Media, Dental Sleep Practice Magazine. I'm Dr. Steve Karstensen, Chief Dental Editor of Dental Sleep Practice Magazine, a Medmark publication. Welcome to an educational presentation in Q&A with Dr. Jeff Rogers and Dr. Tiffany Stratton. In our webinar today, we'll be covering how collaboration is essential to implementing a cohesive sleep apnea screening and intervention program. You'll also hear a lot about the digital workflow, which can really revolutionize how your practices can be. Before we get started, I'd like to invite viewers to use the chat box on the right side of your screen and ask any questions. Your questions will be answered at the end of the session. Now, let me introduce our esteemed speakers for today. Dr. Jeff Rogers is a board certified expert in sleep who has been in private practice for over 20 years, a diplomat of both the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine and the American Sleep and Breathing Academy. Jeff treats patients who suffer from sleep breathing disorders in, at Sleep Better Georgia. Dr. Tiffany Stratton earned her doctorate of dental surgery degree from the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, didn't move far away. Her passion to help the community drives her to ensure the traditional office experience is as enjoyable as possible. Without further ado, I'll turn the webinar over to you to learn more about our topic for today. Dr. Rogers. Very good. Thank you for uh, the kind words, Steve. Thanks for having me here today. Um, as you said, I'm Jeff Rogers. I practice in Atlanta, Georgia, and have been doing so for, uh, crazily, I'm coming up on about 30 years of, uh, of it at this point. Um, uh, the short version of my story is I've been practicing dentistry for about 27 years, a little over. Um, and I had an interest in going and starting to do sleep uh, in about the year 2000. Uh, my first case was my mother. This is one of my favorite stories, so I'll take a minute to, to tell it. But my mother had been diagnosed with severe sleep apnea. For those of you in the know, she, her age, I was about 121. Um, and she literally took the CPAP off in the middle of her split night test and told the technician, I will die in my sleep before I put that thing back on my head. Uh, and at that point, uh, the, the short version is she ended up coming to me, even though I begged her not to, because I had no clue what I was doing. Uh, but a good friend and mentor, Dr. Kent Smith, uh, who many of you know, uh, walked me through treating her and it went well. Uh, how it went well is a first case on an AHI of 121, I'll never know. Uh, but blind luck is, you know, even a blind squirrel finds a nut now and again, sort of a thing. So uh, it went well, and that kind of got me on this journey. Uh, so my first case was 22-ish years ago, um, and I decided that, you know, I was one of those guys that did five to 10 cases a year for uh, a number of years. And then in the last 10 years, sleep really became a significant part of the practice. Um, and then about four or five years ago, I uh, went sleep only. Uh, and now all I do is treat sleep apnea. Um, it has, uh, you know, people often think, oh, it must be so nice to go treat the sleep apnea. It really is. But you're, you're trading one set of problems from general dentistry to another when you go to uh, sleep only. Um, but well worth it for me. The, you know, people often ask, and I talk quite a bit at various meetings about, you know, kind of what got you to sleep only? How did you get there from, you know, doing crown and bridge, kind of drill and fill and fill them? Uh, the polite way was working your, working your uh, tail off. Um, it really is a lot of work. And I love talking about collaboration with MDs because that's really, that's the, for, to make it sound a little crass, that's that's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, it is very expensive to do external marketing for sleep apnea, especially in the state of Georgia, where I am not allowed to uh, dispense HSTs for diagnostic uh, sleep testing. So I am literally living at the whim of my referring physicians. Um, and so without them, I cannot function. Now, I don't have an issue living uh, with the physicians. I think they are, they are qualified to do these things. And, and I like it because there are, as you all know, there are times that uh, we need them more than others, but many times you need them badly. Uh, and so working your tail off is the hardest thing. 
And when people talk about, you know, what, how did you, how did you, uh, you know, make, the, there's a mental shift along with a system shift when you go from dentistry to, to sleep medicine. Um, insurance billing is certainly one of the struggles, but I think that's the struggle that everybody thinks, oh, the, the, it's the only struggle. Like if I could overcome this hurdle, that's all I need to do. Um, and Tiffany's going to talk more about systems than I am. And so she'll, she'll, you know, you can get more out of that for that. But the insurance billing, it's a headache. Um, you know, when we, when we bill for a crown or when I used to bill for a crown, um, you know, you send in a code that says we did a crown and this is the date we did it on. Once in a while, you might get pushed back and have to send in an x-ray. I will tell you for, um, most of my straightforward cases, there are certain insurance companies that are easier than others, but their Blue Cross, for example, is a big player in my market. And we send in dozens of sheets of information every single time. And they review all of it. Um, and if your I's aren't dotted and T's aren't crossed, it's a problem. So if you're just getting into this, that still doesn't mean insurance billing is your big hurdle. There are companies out there that will help you with this, namely, uh, if, well, I won't name names on the webinar, I apologize, but there's a lot of good insurance co insurance billing companies out there that will help you with this. But most people think it's insurance billing, and the second hurdle is insurance billing, and maybe even the third and fourth hurdle are insurance billing, and then a little marketing. How do I get patients in the chair? Um, in my mind, the real struggles in developing a sleep practice and getting uh, getting more volume. One is dentist and staff issues around poor case presentation technique. It's a very different thing to talk to someone as a dental sleep medicine specialist than as a dentist. Um, you've got to meet them where they are, in my opinion. Um, and you've got to track results. You've got to make sure you're handling objections uh, well, um, because there are a lot of objections to this. Um, but then the biggest one is poor communicate, poor physician communication, and poor physician management. Um, you are no. I am no longer. I am probably 85% referral based, and yet 85% of my marketing budget probably still goes to external marketing direct patients. But the holy grail, is, like I said, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is the, that referring physician. Once that referring physician trusts you, once you build a relationship, life is so much easier. But the number one issues, uh, and this is from a very informal survey that actually Dr. Smith did at one of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine meetings. He went around and just started asking sleep physicians. What's the number one reason you don't refer to a dentist? Number one is uh, patient cost. They don't want the patients to have to spend a lot of money out of pocket. So that goes back to the insurance. You have to be able to deal with the insurance. Uh, number two was when I refer a patient to a dentist, they fall into a black hole. I never hear from them. I never see them again. I never hear from the dentist. I don't know if this patient's getting treatment. I don't know what I'm supposed to, am I supposed to be following up with they don't know. We have to inform our physicians, tell them what we want, and ask them what they want from us. We make their lives easier when we do it right. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But the, the patient, the, the physician collaboration for me is really the cornerstone which all other issues are, are built upon. Um, when you see a patient with an MD, are you sending them a thank you note for the referral? Even if that patient doesn't come in, the physician has still done the thing you want them to do. So I want to say, thank you for the referral. Thank you for the referral of Mr. Smith. Um, we tried to contact them three times via phone and once via email, and they still have not scheduled. So we are now putting them back in, in, your, in your court. Um, Thank you for the referral of Mr. Smith. We contacted him twice and his upcoming appointment is on September 14th. Um, they want to know because they have an ethical and legal obligation to make sure that patient is being followed up on properly, just like we do. 
And I'm not one of these guys that likes to badmouth all physicians. I work with some really great physicians that truly care about their patient just as much as I do. Um, and they have the patient best interest at heart. So I want to make sure that physician knows I have contacted the patient and they have or have not scheduled. Then once I see the patient, I want the physician to know I've seen the patient. Sometimes that means, hey, I've seen Mr. Smith and they have no teeth and their AHI is 140. You know, I'm totally making up for something. Um, and they're not a candidate. Uh, I've seen Mrs. Jones and she has TMJ such that she can't open her mouth more than four millimeters. Uh, she's not a candidate, so I am sending them back to you. I have, and they love it when the dentist who only makes sleep appliances says, I have reiterated the need for this patient to be treated with CPAP, and I am referring them back to you. How lovely is that, that now that physician, just like we like it, how lovely is that for the physician to say, oh my God, a third party, completely no financial interest in this patient at this point, has just reiterated to this patient the need for the treatment I recommended to them. It is just as good for them as it is for us when they say, when they, I have told Mrs. Jones she is not doing well with CPAP and I am referring her to you for oral appliance therapy. It preheats the patient and it affirms the expertise of the referring doctor. Um, treatment updates. This one's pretty simple, uh, and I think Tiffany's going to talk a little more about this, so I won't belabor it, but every time we see a patient, I want that referring physician to get a very short letter from me. And by very short letter, I mean at most two or three paragraphs, never longer than a page. And it says something very generic. We saw the patient today. They're doing well. We're going to see them for follow-up soon. Thank you for the referral of this patient. Have a great day. Or... I'm referring this patient back to you for follow-up efficacy testing to make sure the appliance is working. As a reminder, their diagnostic AHI was blank. Thank you very much for the referral of this patient. I used to send six pages of soap notes, literally six pages of soap notes with every patient. And when I switched to the one-page letters, every single physician that works in a hospital system called me and said, thank goodness you're not sending me those you know, novel size letters anymore, which brings you to another point. Ask the physicians what communication works for them. The physicians that were upset with my novel length letters were upset because the hospital system required them to initial every single page of every letter that I sent before it could get scanned into the system to verify that the physician had read it. My top referring physicians there are days I was sending them 150 to 200 pages of letters every day. Can you imagine the headache of this? So we're down to one sheet. It tells them what they want to know. If they want soap notes, if they want anything further, they know how to reach me. Sending case completion. Again, all these letters. Good, good communication with the, the patient or with the uh, physician. And it, every single letter ends with some version of, if you have patients similar to Mrs. Jones, who are also struggling with CPAP, we would be happy to see them for a complimentary consultation to see if they're a candidate. Basically, thank you for trusting me. If you have anyone else like this one, please send them over. We're happy to see them. Um, all of that, the nice thing about all of that is if you're using a good EMR, most of this is very, very simple, very quick. Um, it is not a lot of work to get this done. It's mostly automated. Um, and it, it's cheap. Um, it's literally a, a letter and a stamp. Um, or even cheaper, a letter and a fax. That's another thing I always do. Each physician, do you prefer these letters via email? Do you prefer them snail mail? Or do you prefer them via fax? Um, and each physician has a little different thing they like. And so you have to keep up with that in your office. To, it's easy to develop a system to do that. Um, also, uh, with regard to MDs, you want to make sure that you make it easy for them to send patients to you. Uh, so when we have a new MD, I create a, I have a generic 
prescription form that I go in and put their information in. Um, and so I let, I, I give them a checkbox prescription sheet that they can sign, fill in the blanks. And I want them to, I want it easy. I want to make their life as easy as possible. Um, and remind them why they're working with you. Is it your credentials, clinical success, the, the ease of the referral process? Um, patient physicians don't want to think about what insurance you're in network with. So we work with everybody we possibly can. They want to know you're in Medicare. They want to know all of that kind of good stuff. And they want to know that when it's time for the follow-up testing, you're referring back to them. Um, that's, that's huge. And I should have added one here that says, they want to know that you know you don't have a magic bullet. If you have a sleep practice where 100% of your patients are being treated perfectly with a sleep appliance, you have either done two or three appliances or you're not being honest with yourself and you're referring physicians. It doesn't work on everybody. It works on most everybody, thank goodness. But they want to hear this appliance isn't working and I'm referring them back to you. Make it easy. Um, I also, I'm almost through. I just wanted to touch on a couple things that really kind of started through COVID or just before COVID that really saved us going through COVID. But they have now become part of our regular systems. Um, it is really the, the WatchPat one really changed the way we do sleep testing in my office. I told you we are not allowed to do diagnostic sleep testing. In my office, I do have an MD uh, in the office, and so uh, we do we do do that. The WatchPat one has been instrumental. One, in, for, so first we started with the WatchPat 300s. I think I still have 10 or 12 of them at the office. Um, but they're all gathering dust at this point. The WatchPat one makes it so easy to do a telemed visit with the patient and then say, I'm going to mail you this test. It loads on an app on the phone. They don't have to mail anything back. It's single use, it's clean. It's super easy for the patients to use. And we have that data back quicker than if they were mailing me back a WatchPat 300. We've got the data the next day. And the patient, we can, we've can we sent this to patients in California. We've sent them, uh, we've sent one overseas, but I can't remember where it was. It just works beautifully. And this is what sustained us truly through, through quarantine. Because even though we were essential and we could have patients in the office, nobody wanted to come in. Um, and so these WatchPat ones and tell them that really, really saved us. Um, and that's really, in a nutshell, that's all I've got today. Uh, thank you again for your time. If anybody wants to reach out to me privately, uh, there's all my contact info. And uh, I look forward to it. I look forward to hearing what Tiffany has to say. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. That's very interesting. Um, I do have a couple of questions uh, for you just before sure. we get to Tiffany and then um, going on from there. So uh, could you say a little bit more about Georgia's uh, HST laws? Now, I know what I want to say, I guess, is that if you're watching this from other states, that's a state by state ruling. Yes. And the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine has done a very good job of, of keeping up to date on the changes in state rulings. And so always go to aadsm.org and there's a, a, a easy link to a map there and you can look at your own state's uh, regulations. Yes. So tell me about Georgia. What's anything new going on down there? So not right now. The, there's In the state of Georgia, I think we're one of three states, unless that has changed, that does not allow a dentist to dispense an HST for diagnostic purposes. Um, now, there are various interpretations, but that is how the word, the, that is the written word in the uh, Dental Practice Act for Georgia. Right. Um, a, there's been some good legal opinions published in the state of Georgia that says, I can still use it for tie training and appliance okay. uh, because that's not a diagnostic HST and I'm not doing the diagnosing. Um, but right now in the state of Georgia, you can't. Um, it is very different. And I completely agree with you, Steve. David Schwartz, as president of the Academy, or most recent president, he's not currently, started this campaign to push back. I do not agree. It is silly that we cannot administer an HST, especially when there's somewhere around 50,000 sleep apnea, apnea patients 
per sleep physician in the United States. There's no way they can handle that demand. And I don't want to diagnose. I'm still very happy, you know, having a physician diagnosed. But that's the way it is in the state of Georgia. So I have to be very, very careful with that. And again, that's why I have the sleep physician at the office now to, uh, so we can make sure we're staying, doing everything right. I loved what you said about the communications with the physicians, especially the part about getting with each physician and asking them, okay, what do you want from me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we have a spreadsheet uh, that the whole office can look at that this physician wants email, snail mail, fax. This physician wants, uh, if it's disappointment, this physician is going to want the soap notes. If it's disappointment, the physician will want this. Um, it's been, it's, it's a little bit tedious at the beginning to set that up, but once it's there, it's so easy. It really makes a difference. Yeah. And um, I know you're, uh, you're careful with HIPAA and PHI and email and all those kind of things, but so Thank as you. You, as you dentists out there uh, set up an email, somebody says email. I actually have one physician uh, who insists we send him an email. He doesn't care about PHI, and so yeah. it's like we have to code things for him. But uh, but you know what? Every all these the physicians are humans too. They want it the way they want it, right? Right. So you work with them on an individual basis. Um, so and you mentioned an MD in the office. That's a new model that's coming around, becoming more popular. Tell me a little bit more about that, please. So it's um, it's interesting to have him there has been absolutely amazing. Um, it streamlines our workflow, and he he has been historically one of my top referring physicians. Oh. But if I send him a patient to his office, they're so backed up. It's and, and he's got to work within his hospital system, you know, it may be two or three months before I get test results, before I can move forward with a patient. Yeah. With him, he literally comes in twice a week. He sits at a desk, does telemed visits. And I, in the last three months, he's probably ordered and, and diagnosed maybe 150 sleep tests. I mean, it's just been fantastic. And, and if you come in on a Monday, I can have you tested and, and ready to roll by Wednesday. Um, it's wonderful. So that's a great illustration of how in the changing world that we're living in, we can find a solution to a problem. Yeah. So congratulations on that, that getting um, a crack in that uh, back of that dam that yeah. sometimes occurs. Yeah, getting people diagnosed. If I could add one thing to it, though, if you if you are looking at doing that model, you need to talk to a very good healthcare attorney mm -hmm. um, because there are very hard and fast rules that you may not break uh, because of stark sunshine anti kickback statutes. Um, you you really there is no gray area here. It's a and if you break some of those rules. It's not Blue Cross calling you to, to recoup your fee. It's uh, somebody showing up with handcuffs kind of a thing. You, you have to be very, very careful with that. Well, it's actually something you did mention. You sent a watch pat one to a patient in California. And um, unless you have a California license, for example, you can't talk to that patient if they're on vacation in California. Uh, well, that. yeah, the, the, that one. Yes, that's correct. You're crossing state lines at that point. Yeah, so you gotta be, what, what learners here have to be careful about those yeah. kind of things as well. There's a lot of things to be careful about about this, but they're not insurmountable uh, objects. They're not insurmountable problems. You know, you, right. you managed it, so there's anybody out there can manage it as well. Very good. Yeah, yeah. very good. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Dr. Rogers. Um, we may come back with more questions at the end here, uh, depending on what's posted. And uh, now it's on to Dr. Stratton. Well, I'm Dr. Stratton, Tiffany Stratton. Uh, my office is called Lucid. Uh, we, do with, we deal mostly with sleep apnea. A little bit of background on me. I had a dental practice for about eight years that I owned, and um, I was actually diagnosed with a condition called narcolepsy. Um, went through treatment um, for that sleep disorder for years uh, and ended up trying a new medication for that that ended up I ended up having a dystonic reaction to it and um, it basically if you don't know what dystonia is it's sort of like a seizure um, and I was having about seven to eight episodes of those a day so I ended up selling my dental practice um, just because life was a little too much to handle at that moment 
Um, took about two years off and really missed patient care and um, understood what excessive daytime sleepiness is. And so I decided to go into sleep. And I have been 100% uh, sleep only practice since 2019. And we have always been 100% digital. So I started a little more recently and um, didn't want to mess with a lot of the uh, old school ways of doing things. So what's the digital workflow? Uh, Jeff uh, touched on a lot of these things in his presentation. Uh, digital marketing, online submission forms, sleep quality quizzes. We have all of this on our website. Uh, having a good website is really important in today's age. You really can't get by without it. Uh, we do have a patient portal that is HIPAA compliant. Um, digital health history forms, big game changer. These actually integrate into our EMR. I have tried so many EMRs in sleep and it's still such a new, um, I guess, type of practice in dentistry that there aren't that many options. Um, and billing medical uh, is so very different than billing uh, dental. And so we really searched far and wide for a really good EMR. And I have a love-hate relationship with all of them. So um, I think we've kind of worked out most of the kinks with our latest one, and we are able to do all of these things mostly seamlessly and trying to um, every month improve on one process or another. Uh, we do use a pharyngometer, rhinometer, an intraoral scanner. We do CBCTs, and we do use the WatchPAT one, HSATs. Um, we have clinical note templates that are all digital and also auto-populated communication for MDs. Jeff went into that in detail and it is just the click of a button and it is faxed uh, automatically to those physicians. So it makes life really easy. Um, okay, so rhinometer and pharyngometer. If you're not familiar with what it is, it's a tool that allows us to um, gauge whether or not there's um, nasal resistance, nasal polyps, turbinates, deviated septum, all of those things up at the top tells us that we have a patent airway um, through the nose, which is really important. My ENTs love this. If we can't breathe through our nose, then we can't effectively do our job in treating um, obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, the pharyngometer gives us a baseline. It measures the collapsibility of the airway. It tells us whether or not they're gonna be a candidate. It's a good visual for these patients to see what we're looking at. Um, and it allows us to get that optimal position um, verified. We use it mostly in troubleshooting. We'll verify our positions um, and it gets us to the end game a lot quicker. Also, I'd like to add that I think um, if you have a patient who's non-responsive to treatment, you can kind of troubleshoot with the pharyngometer um, to see if there's a better position that maybe you missed and um, that's really helpful. So that's another digital digital solution. We do get graphs and reports and we send those over to our ENT um, if the patient needs to be seen by one of them. Digital scanning. Um, I have always had an iTero from the very first one that was, you know, a two second buzz click um, for each picture and now it's so much faster. Uh, there's so many different um, impression, uh, digital impression systems out there and I've tried some of them. For me, that's the iTero works and that's just what, what I've, I've stuck with. Uh, what are the disadvantages of impressions? Everybody knows this, uh, pulls, tears, bubbles, voids. You can look at the entire list. You know, one of the biggest one is, is, is space. Having to save all of those working models is, is, it's just crazy to have to uh, keep those for so many years. We don't have to do that if it's a digital workflow. Um, we don't have to worry about um, doing it wrong. We can always, you know, scan a, uh, just a piece of that model over again if we got it wrong. Um, it gets to the lab faster. Um, they get to fabricate the appliance faster. It's a lot more accurate. So you guys know what this is here. All of the problems seen with conventional impressions. The only impression material we have in our office is blue bite to stabilize the the bite during scanning. Um, so again, digital scanning advantages. A uh, big one is faster laboratory return and appliance accuracy. So also patients are, are, are more comfortable. They have less anxiety. Um, and if they lose it, break it, it's easy to refabricate. 
I love the Itero because it does scan uh, year over year and you can see the difference between uh, the teeth position and how much they have moved. Um, and if the patient is complaining about tooth movement three months later, we can scan them and overlap those two scans and see if it's actually had movement or not. So it's, it's a good baseline for us to, to track that. Um, CBCT, again, better diagnosis, visualization of sinuses and turbinates, but it's also billable to medical insurance and our ENTs love this too. We do send these scans over to them um, and they really appreciate it. And then of course, disposable HST, HSAT advantages. Easy to use, it's accurate, less visits, easy to use app, patient preferred, and sanitary one-time use. We've gone through so many different types of HSATs. I also have a medical director in my office. And uh, at the beginning, she preferred, you know, a belt, effort belt, nose cannula, um, and that's what her, her preference was. So we started with those and patients we're happy to have that at home. Uh, one thing we ran across with that physician is that I like to uh, submit to insurance based on a patient's RDI, not necessarily the AHI. Because if we have people who are just, you know, light snorers who don't necessarily have severe apnea, they have, you know, problems. They have excessive daytime sleepiness. They're usually the ones that will actually respond the best to an oral appliance, a really tiny oral appliance, typically very small vertical and horizontal. Um, and, and we can submit to um, insurance with that RDI. Now the WatchPad does measure sleep time. Um, and so we switched to the WatchPad 300 um, a while back and used that because it did give us some of that sleep time. Um, and what that does is it decreases, or it actually gets a more accurate diagnosis as opposed to older machines that didn't do that. Um, and so our physician, you know, kind of advised us that that's what's gonna happen. We're gonna be able to diagnose more people um, by using that technology uh, with with um, the patients. So we switched to, I think we ordered our first box of WatchPat ones right before COVID hit. Um, and then again, like like Jeff said, COVID, COVID came and we, we ended up having not a lot of people who wanted to come out to see us. And so we would ship these out to them um, remotely. They would do a telemedicine visit with our physician uh, and she would interpret it probably within three to four days. It actually made her practice go completely telemedicine. Uh, we still have to have a scan, we still have to have a delivery, so we don't do it all the way, but we do a lot more telemedicine than I think we ever would have if COVID hadn't come. And it's sanitary one-time use. Um, it's really easy to use, it's really easy to initiate. Um, and my my assistants will not touch a WatchPat 300 even if unless we run out of the watch pat ones and a patient really needs to be tested. So it's, it's been a game changer for us. Um, also O2 monitoring. So we do send a patient home with one of these. It's less expensive titration. The patients get a visual representation of what their oxygen levels are doing. It increases patient compliance and it improves our telemedicine visits. Um, as most of you know, that, that ODI oxygen, lowest DSAT where it's really difficult to get that to come up. And if we're being successful in, um, you know, decreasing the amount of time that they're, they're spending desaturated, then we know we're going in the right direction. And a lot of times telemedicine, um, especially with some of these appliances that you just switch out trays and there's not any cranking to do, it's really easy to monitor them from home. They don't have to come in. Um, and it's just increased our efficiency. We get to the end point a lot faster. Uh, once we get these numbers looking good, we will always uh, post-op sleep study them just to um, ensure that we are treating the apnea as well. Um, and that's it, you know, again, the physical letters, physician letters, um, sorry, we, we do those as well. At the end of treatment, we always coordinate that care with um, our physicians and we let them know that we were successful in treating those patients. Um, and also ask them for more referrals as well. So um, that's kind of our digital workflow. It's all um, hopefully as up-to-date as possible. We're always looking for the newest um, and best way to do something. Uh, it all kind of started with trying to minimize the number of appointments that these patients have to go to. If you can imagine having to be referred out to a sleep physician, have that sleep study read by that physician and come back to us again, it was about six appointments that we reduced to about three um, and you know, two of those can be telemedicine visits. 
So it's, it's about efficiency and it's about doing what's best for our patients. And I feel like we've been able to do that with all of the technology that we have. Thank you, Dr. Stratton. Here's a couple of questions that have come in. Um, tell us more about the, the watch pad one. Well, yeah, you were pretty clear on that one, but there's a lot of different devices out there, flow-based devices and non-flow-based devices. How did you and your physician, did you guys work together on that decision? Yeah, we did. We did. Uh, like I said, we had a lot of, um, I think she was using the ResMed Apnea Link Airs for a long time and a lot of them broke and then she wasn't able to get them. Um, parts were hard to find. We had, we were using her, her machines to distribute to, to the patients that she would see telemedicine. She's actually in Kerrville. I have two locations. Um, and so physically she wasn't able to be in San Antonio, but um, we would telemedicine with her for our patients in San Antonio as well. And as those machines became less and less available, we, we started ordering more and more of the WatchPat ones because we can scale that if, if we know we're running low on it and we know our numbers are increasing, you know, the more you order, the better discount you get too. So we, we started ordering in bulk and, and having those readily available. So it, it really has helped us to scale and grow. Um, and again, like I said, the biggest benefit for us was that it, it measures sleep time. Hmm. It's so easy to, to compare uh, the nights before and the nights with treatment. It's right there online, so you can share it with the patient. It's, it's just a very convenient device, isn't it? It is, very yeah. much so. Yeah, so, so you and, and Dr. Rogers both have a bunch of WatchPath 300s for sale, is that the? <laughs> no, we keep ours still. We, we use them every now and then, like I said. Maybe someone forgot to order those WatchPath ones and <laughs> we need them. <laughs> Hey, uh, one question that comes up a lot with the digital files and, and the models is how long do you keep the digital files? You know, I guess that's an easy question, but then the next one is more important. If somebody loses a device or the dog gets it, how long do you rely on the digital file the, to be able to make a new appliance? And that could be for either one of you guys, both of you guys, as a matter of fact. I don't have a fast, hard rule of thumb. I've only been doing this a few years, you know, I think three years total or if you count training, but um, usually if it's, if it's a dog that's going to eat it, they're probably going to get that within the first three months. So we'll use, we'll use the same model. Um, and hopefully if we're wrapping the distal and using a really high quality uh, type of device, you know, we won't get that much tooth movement. Um, so I don't know, Jeff, what's your experience with that? Yeah, it's about the same. We, you, we first we keep the files forever. That's the beauty of digital, right? I mean, there's no reason to ever get rid of the files. Um, but the the only time we won't use the existing, you know, if the dog gets a hold of it, my first question to the patient is, "Have you been wearing your appliance?" And if they say it's been three months since I wore the appliance, then I generally will make them get a new scan. If it's in that six weeks to three month window, and this is this is ballpark, right? This is there's no hard and fast rule here. But if it's six weeks to three months, I generally will tell them we can use your old one, but when you put this in, you're going to be sore. You know, it, it's going to be like the kid who forgot to you know lost their retainer at McDonald's and you know found it three months later. Um, when you put it in, you're just going to be sore. Uh, and so I give them the choice at that point. Um, but it also depends if it's been three to five years and it was a worn out appliance, you know, it was getting close to worn out, then I'll just say, no, we, it's time to make a new one. Let's just go ahead and make a new one. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's good knowledge. So, uh, Jeff, you transitioned to dental practice from a general practice to uh, all sleep. Tiffany, you kind of took a break, right? Did you do uh, sleep medicine in your general practice for those years or... I did do a little bit of it. Um, yeah, it was straightforward. It's, the clinical part's pretty easy. Um, but, you know, going into sleep, I just, after going totally sleep just from the beginning, I don't see how, I don't see how I could have done uh, a transition very easily or quickly. Um, it's really hard to get those processes down for administrative processes, the insurance. It's really difficult. It's not the clinical part. The clinical part's pretty straightforward, um, you know, but peeling back that onion every time you look at a process and procedure with insurance and it changes the next month, um, you just, you find there's, there's more things that, that need to be taken care of that you didn't realize as just a clinician. So the admin side, tough, tough barrier 
to overcome if you're just a general dentist trying to get into it. What would you say there, Jeff, in terms of transitioning yeah. to, uh, team members as well? Yeah. It, it was tough. It, it, and, and it was tough for every reason Tiffany just said. It's hard. And, and it's not just systems, but it's also, uh, it, it's a mental shift. Uh, you have to literally change how, what, what you define as success. You know, you're, you're no longer going, oh, I need a 40 micron mount, crown margin. Give me my Explorer and let me make sure that's, you know, that doesn't click kind of thing. Um, you have to learn to be successful with a less than stellar result. Um, you know, if you take a patient from a 36 to a 12, you know, and, and I remember the first time I did a case like that, and I got the physician letter back that said, you know, the patient still has mild apnea, you know, do something. Um, I called the physician. I said, I can't move them any further. And he said, okay, great. Leave them where they are. And I said, well, wait, your letter says something different. He said, I have to tell you it's still mild apnea. That doesn't mean it's not a successful case you know, they're asymptomatic. And I'm like, oh, this is, I'm, I've got to make a shift here. You know? Uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's tough for every reason that Tiffany said it's, and, and I've got a couple friends who did like Tiffany just started sleep from scratch and man, that's a gutsy move. And, you know, she's doing great. Tiffany's doing great. I, you know, I more power to her, but it, it's an impressive thing to see. Um, but yeah, that's it. We do have to get our team members to accept uh, maximum medical improvement, what you just talked about there, Jeff, yeah. because they're used to the dentist who says 40 microns, clicky margins. Oh, well, wait a minute. We got to think this through and maybe we didn't get it right. Or, you know, all the things that we beat ourselves up about. Yeah. As dentists. But uh, to say to a patient who's happily uh, sleeping through the night and back in the bedroom and feeling good in the daytime that, wow, you still have mild sleep apnea, look at all those symptom relief. You know, that's a whole different kind of training for our team members. Absolutely. One of the things I think that Jeff uh, said, I don't know how long ago, but it's stuck in my mind is that this treatment always works. I've never not seen it yeah. work. We just don't know how well it's going to work for you. Right. Um, and that's really, it's been a good, I guess, phrase for me to tell my team members as well. I love that one. Yeah. So what, how did you go about training your team members? What was, was this in office or did you have, uh, do you have a resource that can be used? What do you think? Uh, we you wanna go first, Tiffany? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I started with one assistant and I took her to pretty much every single course that I went to for sleep apnea uh, during that year of kind of transition for myself. Um, it was probably 150 hours and she was right there, right alongside with me. Um, I trust her implicitly to just take care of the patients as good as I would. Um, again, we also acquired another assistant who had been trained by another sleep doctor, who, which was lucky for us. She had a lot of knowledge. Um, but we typically will take our, our team members that are new through a training. Um, unfortunately, I think Dr. Smith's training isn't happening this October, which was kind of our um, annual retreat, you know. Um, but we do, we use, you know, standardized kind of um, process of explanation very basic first and then add on to that um, as well as training on the emr which is a whole other system mm -hmm. so yeah it, it definitely it's a huge learning curve for pretty much anybody you can't pick up a sleep specialist just about anywhere um, for dental you can get a medical biller that you can train you can get a dental assistant that you can train you can get a medical assistant you can train um, but really people that come in it's a lot to learn and it's a very different process yeah well, I, yeah. I got to put in a plug for a great New York dental meeting. We do have a uh, co pretty comprehensive four days, uh, two two full days of treatment spread up our uh, teaching over four days in New York at the Great New York Dental Meeting, sponsored by Medmark Media. So my, my publisher is very happy I got a chance to say that. <laughs> great. Jeff, how did you train your staff? Um, so we, we're similar because of our transition. We have we have two groups, right? The staff that transitioned with me and, and there's only a few of those left, right? It, just from, for churn rate, but, and then who we hire now. And so the transition, the transition wasn't, it, it, it was lengthy, right? So, but it, the nice part about it was as I was learning 
all my staff was going with me and they were learning also, right? So that they kind of were at the same stage I was. Um, but today, um, I, I hate training. I, I actually just abhor training people. Um, so we hire for attitude. Um, within the first 90 days, um, and this has taken a little bit of a, we've had to adjust this through COVID, uh, I, I require every new team member, whether you are answering the phones, whether you are sleep assistant, whether you, whatever, I require every uh, team member to have gone through uh, Dr. Smith's seminar program, uh, the Wasted Days seminar. Um, that gives them an excellent foundation, but training in office, now we generally try and hire medical assistants because it's easier for me to train them to do a scan and the pharyngometer and that kind of stuff than it is to train a dental assistant out of the mindset of dentistry. Um, and so we make, the, we make the medical assistant or anybody would hire shadow one of our main sleep assistants for around a month, like sit in every appointment. Um, and that helps with the, like Tiffany said, EMR is a huge training work. Um, and, but the medical assistant is a little more familiar with EMR type stuff than like an Eagle soft entrance, you know, whatever. Um, and so we make them shadow, um, and then by the end of the month, then we'll start letting them see a patient on their own, but they are constantly being watched, supervised, audited, that kind of a thing. So that, I bet that does a lot of confidence when they are seeing their patients on their own then, because they know they have yes. a, kind of an excellent training. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, every doc, every dentist office does individually, but to be able to approach it with a, you can do this attitude and a, We'll give you all the background you need for confidence with the patients. That that also builds a collaboration because when the patients go back to the sleep physician and say, "Oh yeah, they took such good care of me there," and they yeah. really liked you know Sally over at the office, well then that's going to be uh, improvement to uh, referral base, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, and that's something that's important for the dentist to make sure they are um, reinforcing the expertise of a well-trained sleep, you know, assistant. Um, so when the patient, you know, if I'm in the room with the patient, the patient says, oh, well, when I come back, am I going to see you? No, Susan is going to take care of you. She knows, you know, if, if you have a difficult problem, then Susan may come and get me. I'll be here. But Susan's, you're going to, most of your appointments are going to be with Susan, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And of course, the assistants can take care of uh, dispensing and working with and training the, the patients on the use of the watch pads that you guys are using. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Because so it doesn't have to be the dentist doing that all the time, right? It's so straightforward. Very good. Well, uh, what any last? We're about out of time. Uh, so, um, Dr. Stratton, any any final thoughts, encouragement for our, our our learners here? No, I just think you know if you can wrap your mind around all the processes and procedures and the technology and make that jump forward, that it's an extremely rewarding group of people to work with. Um, dentistry, sometimes a little bit competitive uh, individually, I guess. Uh, my experience was that way. But um, coming into the sleep community has been just a warm hug, you know, very welcoming. Um, Jeff and Kent have been great mentors to me along with a lot of other people. Uh, and I've learned so much over the last three years and I'm so grateful to have uh, these people in my in my back pocket and also to be a part of something that is so much more rewarding for me personally than dentistry ever was. Um, I love sleep. I just think it's a great, great fit for my lifestyle, great fit for, I've got four kids. Um, so it, it offers me a lot more flexibility and we can, like I said, do a lot of that maintenance work, telemedicine. So for me, it's been a wonderful, wonderful lifestyle. Um, and I guess intellectually, it's been challenging, and um, I've made some really great friends. So, fantastic. Yeah, Jeff, what would you say? Yeah, I would say that for me, it's a it's a stick to it thing. Um, I was talking to I was actually talking to Joel this morning, and he reminded me of the perfect phrase. It's the, you know, it took me fifteen to twenty years to become an overnight sensation kind of a thing, right? Um, it is like, for example, my number one referring physician uh, right now for the first five years would not return a call. Mm. I couldn't get into his office to say hello. He, I would call, I would email, nothing. 
And, but once you break through, it's just this constant wear. It's like, you know, water building the Grand Canyon sort of a thing. You just got to keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. It's, it's truly nose to the grindstone sort of, sort of work. Um, and then once you're there, it's a little easier to maintain once you reach that critical mass. So mm -hmm. stick to it is my, my summation. <laughs> because the rewards are really, really palpable when you get to be helping people breathe better at nighttime and solving those, uh, troublesome symptoms that they're complaining about. Exactly uh, right. The first time you see a couple cry because they can sleep in the same bed again, yeah. like, oh, this is why I do what I do. This is it. Yeah. There we go. Well, thank you everyone for your questions. We've run out of time today. We didn't get to your questions. We'll answer it in a, a webinar by email. Shortly, we'll send you a link to the replay of the presentation. Thank you again for attending and a special thank you to Dr. Jeff Rogers, Dr. Tiffany Stratton, and our sponsor for this webinar, Zol Itamar. Thank you. Be well. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>